স্যার কি প্রেজেন্টেশন মোডে গেছেন স্যার আপনার ভিডিও ভিডিওটা অফ হয়ে গেছে স্যার আমি হিরব বলছিলাম হ্যালো শুনতে পাচ্ছেন হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা শুনতে পাচ্ছি স্যার শুনতে পাচ্ছি স্যার হ্যাঁ আমি স্লাইডটা শেয়ার করছি আচ্ছা আচ্ছা হ্যাঁ আপনার ভিডিওটা ওই জন্য অফ হয়ে গেছে না ভিডিওটা অফ করলাম আমি না হলে না আমার এই এটা কাজ করছে না হ্যাঁ স্যার স্লাইড এসেছে স্যার স্লাইড এসেছে এসেছে তাই তো হ্যাঁ স্যার ফুল স্ক্রিন করুন এবার হ্যাঁ ফুল স্ক্রিন করছি হুম আচ্ছা এবারে স্যার একটু স্যার ম্যাডাম দেখা যাচ্ছে তো হ্যাঁ স্যার দেখতে পাচ্ছি now we are at session 5 session 5 uh, lecture will be delivered by professor pobitra mitra professor pobitra mitra is a professor of computer science and engineering at institute of technology kharagpur he did his phd from indian statistical institute calcutta and btech from indian institute of technology kharagpur he has been an assistant professor at iit kanpur and scientist at center for ai and robotics bangalore he received the inae young engineer award ibm and indian faculty award he has co-authored a book and about 100 research papers in pattern recognition and machine learning Sir, we'll be talking about support vector machine. He's from Department of CSC, from IIT Kharagpur. Sir, uh, I will request to you to start the session. Thank, thank you, thank you very much for the introduction, and I am glad uh, that I have uh, I have uh, uh, given the opportunity to present here. in fact this is probably the third time i am presenting in your in your college and uh, today's topic that i'll speak up is one of uh, one of the very important algorithm in uh, machine learning it is the support vector machine okay uh, one more thing i'd like to say if any of you have any uh, uh, doubt or question Uh, maybe you can you can uh, ask me am i um, is will you uh, how are you doing it are you putting it in the chat box or or both the mode is on uh, someone can uh, switch, turn on his uh, 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 microphone or uh, ah. can access the chat box microphone no, both, both modes are on so okay yes, yes. so actually the the thing is that uh, my my uh, chat box is not visible because i am full screen so if you can ask by microphone uh, that will be better okay if you ask by microphone that will because I, my chat box okay sir okay sir not visible huh. okay so now uh, is my screen visible yes sir it is visible very good. but not in full screen mode sir it is in now it is in is it in yes, full sir. screen mode Yes, now it is okay. 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 So let us come back. So the basic problem that we will solve using the support vector machine is that of classification. That means if you have have if you have two, if you have two uh, classes, you have examples from two classes. You want to have some kind of mechanism. Uh, if you have a training set where you have examples from two classes. Uh, and you want to build some kind of a system which will uh, tell us for a new example which of these two class it belongs to so the simple classification problem to be specific let us initially consider that we will work on a two class classification problem uh, there will will uh, have uh, consider two classes without loss of gender. these two classes can be anything say spam email or non spam email but let us for mathematically consider one class i will consider class level as plus 1 we'll call it the positive class and another class i'll call the class level minus 1 i'll call it the negative class okay so let us see 
So this is the problem. So uh, I have some examples. Uh, by the way, this I think I know, you know, that uh, every example in machine learning can be represented by a set of attributes. Right. So uh, say, for example, if I if I uh, write here, this is attribute one. Uh, let's say call it X one and this is say attribute X two. So, so some attributes of the of the um, examples, right? So, all right. All right. Some attribute of the examples. Okay. So what I, I and then uh, so every example is represented by a vector. In this case, two-dimensional vector x1, x2. So this is a very important point to note. I think if you have not studied it already, um, the important thing is that in machine learning, every example can be denoted by a point, point in some some coordinate system. If, if, if there are two observations or two attributes, for example, it is a two-dimensional point. If there are three, it is a three-dimensional point, n, n-dimensional point. OK, so you can plot them on, the, on some coordinate system. And they, so let's say this uh, this vector x1, x2, I call as the input vector or feature vector or x vector. So this is a uh, every point I'll be represented by a x vector, which I call x1, x2. I represent by a x vector, right? So uh, this I call the x vector. Similarly, uh, the class level, the cl class value of the point, uh, points, I uh, say this point, this has associated class, in this case blue, I, I represent it by a output level y. Okay, so this y for our initially, for our case, we'll assume y to be either plus one for the, either plus one or Or wait, or minus one. Plus one. Wait, wait. Sorry, I I'll go ahead without this. Okay, either plus one or minus one. Right, and uh, what we want to do, as I said before, that we want some kind of mechanism to uh, separate these two classes. Okay, to classify these two classes. How we we'll do this mechanism is we will draw a line. We will draw a line. We call it the linear discriminant. Discriminant because it separates two classes, discriminates between two classes. So we call it a linear discriminant and will draw the line in such a way that all the blue points are in one side and all the red points are in the other side. So if we can draw such a line, I can easily use it for, for a future point. Okay, so how I'll use it for a future point? If you have a new point whose red or blue I don't, red or blue I don't know, what I'll do is that I'll just check which side of the line the point lies in which side of the line the point lies in, right? If the uh, point lies in the blue side, I'll uh, classify it as blue, otherwise uh, red. Uh, mathematically, look at, uh, let us look at one thing. You know from uh, high secondary coordinate geometry that a line has two parts, a origin side and a non-origin side, two sides of a line. What is the uh, thing in the origin side? Origin side is, if you look at uh, uh, the equation, uh, if so, so uh, one more thing to be noted here is that, see this x I said is a vector. How do I represent a line? I represent a line by w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b equal to zero. That is the equation of a line. W2 x2 plus b equal to zero. That is the equation of a line. So if I denote a vector w as the vector w1, w2, the two dimensional vector w1, w2, and we denote x, uh, as I said previously, also as a two di dimensional vector uh, x1, x2, then uh, w1, x1 plus w2, x2 is nothing 
but the dot product of W and the X vector. This you understand clearly. It is the dot product of the uh, 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 these two vectors. Okay, so let me explain it. Let me explain it. So W just So W is W1, W2, X is X1, X2. So if we if we multiply these two, you get W1, X1 plus W2, X2 hmm. plus B is the offset. So you know in the non-origin side, this value, so if you pick up any X which lies in the non-origin side, the value W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus B will be greater than zero. And in the origin side, it will be less than zero. This you know for uh, 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 secondary coordinate geometry. So if I get a new point x, I am no longer no longer referring to x1, x2. I am saying a vector x. Similarly, a weight vector. This is the input vector x, and w is the weight vector w1, w2. So if we get a new vector x, if the uh, vector, uh, I just need to check the sign of w. Uh, w dot x, w dot x and w transpose x is the same thing if you do the matrix multiplication, vector multiplication actually. So w dot x plus v will check the sign. If the sign is positive, we'll put it in one class. If the sign is negative, we'll put it in the other class. So all we need to do is to get a proper w and v and for a new, so that all the blue points are in one side and the red points are in the other side. And and uh, uh, hello. It's easy. Uh, uh, okay. Uh. Yeah. So uh, all the blue points are in one side and the red points are in other side. And uh, uh, and uh, 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 for a new point, I'll just check the sign of. W T W dot X plus B. That will give me my classifier. Okay. So now uh, let us come to the question. How do I draw this line? How do I draw this line? One property of the line I already talked about is that all the plus one y y equal to plus one. That means class it belongs to the positive class plus one class is in one side of the line. Say the non-origin side of the line, and all the mi minus points are in the or origin side of the line. So that is the uh, that is the uh, that is the property we need. Okay, so you should draw. That is one property of the line we require. All the y equal to plus one points should lie in the non-origin side, and y equal to minus one point should lie in the origin side. This is one property, but there are many such lines which satisfy this. See, this is satisfies, this satisfies, all these points satisfy. In fact, if you think a little bit carefully, there will be infinite number of lines which satisfy this property. You can draw infinite number of lines such that the blue is in origin side and the red is in non-origin side. Okay, you can you can draw it that way. Okay, so now the question is that among these infinite possibilities, which line should be chosen? Which line to, to, should be chosen? Okay, or are, are, are all boundaries equally good? Let us take some example, which is not a good boundary. Uh, I'll tell you, we'll see why. Okay, so these two, you see all the square and the circles, uh, both these lines separate, both these lines separate. Uh, but uh, in, in you can sort of intuitively see that they are not very good separators. They are not very good separators. Okay. Whereas uh, if we have if we have something like this which passes to the middle, this is not exactly middle, but something which is passes to the middle, that is probably a good separator. Okay. So uh, uh, if sort of the line uh, goes through the uh, also almost touches these points, then uh, here also almost touches these points, then it is not a good separator. But 
if you can somehow draw a line which passes through the middle something like this which passes through the middle then it is a good separator right so it is not a straight line anymore anyway uh, then it is it is not a good separator so, uh, then it is a good separator right so can anybody tell why uh, this line is not a good separator but this line is a good separator anybody any idea why it is so uh, anybody among the students can you tell why uh, rather this line is a good separator one passing to the middle but this line is not a good separator any answer yeah, anybody want to answer this why why this is so uh, you can intuitively feel that okay maybe this is a good separator but this so is so because uh, so because uh, that is close to the, the support vectors on the right side okay and on to the left hand side uh, so the what distance is the, what is the problem vector. if it is if, if it is close what what will be the problem no if it is close i mean the distance of uh, support vectors on either side of the line um, if that is minimum we consider that uh, boundary to be the best one yes okay but let me let me give an argument like this say so suppose uh, see this line and, and this line existing points both of them classify 100% correctly but suppose if i have a new new point here suppose if i have a new point here then uh, similarly if i draw it here it will be somewhere somewhere here see this point now misclassifies it this point will misclassify it okay, it cannot properly classify whereas this line will still correctly classify it because if it is here it should probably belong to class 2 it, it, so that means the training given training examples both this line and this line are equally good but for an unknown or new training example this line is better than this line that means the generalization capability generalization capability is uh, is uh, better for this line passing to the middle for this line passing to the middle it is better okay so now uh, let us see what what this uh, how can this can be formalized uh, let us define a quant as you have said that let us define a quantity called the margin what is the margin margin is it is margin is for a line with respect to a given set of points so what is the margin margin is uh, is defined as follows uh, the margin of a line is you take the closest point to the line maybe this is the closest point you drop a perpendicular to the from the closest point similarly here also you drop a perpendicular to the line from the from the closest point not from all points from the closest point this minimum perpendicular distance or uh, perpendicular distance is actually the shortest distance so minimum perpendicular distance is called the margin of a line with respect to given set of points okay so if it, it is a, it is a property of both the line and the given. so if there was another point here maybe the margin would have been less hmm. but anyway this point is not given so only these points are given so you can see that if only these uh, printed points are there the uh, the margin of this line the margin of this line so this is my margin this is my margin the margin of this line is much higher than the margin of this line okay so in other words if the margin is higher then it is less likely to make an error on a new point or in other words uh, higher the margin better is the generalization ability better is the generalization ability of the uh, line okay so uh, so uh, uh, what we want to do is that uh, i can now uh, frame my problem like this among all the lines 
which uh, which separates two classes among actually the infinite number of lines which separate these two classes select the one which has the largest margin hmm. in other words we want a large margin classifier select one which has the largest margin so let us uh, do some algebra to see how how that works out and I'll introduce some notations also. I, I, and, and whatever I have qualitatively said, uh, that I will uh, express uh, mathematically. Okay. So uh, uh, this figure is a bit cluttered, but let us look at like this. Uh, so we have a set of n points given. Points means vectors. We have set of n points given, n number of points given. We call them x1, x2 up to xn. And for each of these xi's, so x1, x2, xi, xn. Each of these xi, we have a class level yi, which is plus one or minus one. Right. So you can see here, uh, all these points have class level of plus one, and all these points have class level of minus one. And uh, if if uh, I can if I can write down the equation of this line as w1 x1 plus w well this x1 and this vector x1 are different. This is one of the vectors. This is the equation of the line. Uh, if w is my w1 w2 vector and x is my x1 x2 vector, then w transpose x plus some intercept b, constant b, equal to 0 is the equation of the line. So that is what I have written. This is the equation of the line. w transpose x plus b equal to 0. Okay, so now let us back to condition 1. We said that all the positive points should be, you know, positive point means all the points with y equal to plus 1 should be in the non-origin cell. So we can have a rule that if yi equal to 1, then for the corresponding xi, wt xi plus b, uh, I'll explain why it is plus 1, should be, uh, let us initially assume it is greater than equal to 0, non-origin cell. And if yi equal to minus 1, then this quantity wt x plus b should be less than zero, should be negative. So you consider this as positive and negative. I can actually, so one thing to be observed is that basically the sign of y and the sign of w transpose x plus b should be same. If it is positive, this is positive. If this is negative, this is negative. So in other words, the product of y into wt x plus b should be always positive for all the xi y i given for all the xi y i given w i uh, why this one i'll come later but initially consider this as positive so for all the xi y i y i into w transpose xi plus b should be greater than zero for all if, that means if y is positive this should also be positive if y is negative this should also be negative so this is a constant this is a constant that any line which correctly separates Mm, two classes should follow. Correctly separates two classes to follow. Now, uh, let us come to the second part. Uh, second part in the sense that let us come to the margin part. Uh, as we have defined that uh, margin is distance from the, um, from the closest point to the line perpendicular distance to this. In fact, uh, this point may be in, uh, in in either class. In this particular example, both these points are uh, intentionally put it are at equidistant from this line. So this distance plus this distance, I slightly define the, uh, I, I said margin is the perpendicular distance. It is like, it is the distance in either side of the classes. So you do, you can think of it like this, take this line, now move a parallel line in both sides. This parallel line is shift, shift, shift like this. This side you shift, shift, shift like till it touches one of the point. Moment it touches, you stop there. When it touches, you stop there. Similarly, this side also, moment it touches, you stop there. Right. So in between, you will get a strip like this, where no points are there. 
no points are there in this region. Or, 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 or in the boundary, it is there, but inside, no points is there. So the width of this strip is the margin, which is equivalent to drawing a perpendicular distance uh, from this point to this and taking twice of this, so which is equivalent. Okay, so now, uh, so now I want among all the lines which satisfy this condition. This is the condition for correctly classifying all the training points. One side plus one, other side minus one. Among them, find the one having the highest value of margin. You note that moment you tilt the line, your margin changes. Moment you tilt the line, your margin changes. Okay. All right. So now let us come to the uh, derivation of the value of the margin. Derivation of the value of the margin. Mm. Let me take a clean example that will become. Yeah, okay. Let me do it this. Okay. So what I said, margin is the perpendicular distance from the closest point. Take, let's take any point x i. What is the perpendicular distance from x i to the line? What is the equation of the line? Equation of the line is W uh, transpose or dot product you can take plus B equals to zero. What is the equation of a line to a plane? Uh, let me call it as D. So D is nothing but absolute value of uh, D is the distance from X i to this given line. Again from higher secondary coordinate geometry, you remember it is W1 square plus W2 square. Okay, this is the uh, definition of a, I mean, uh, again, these are vectors. So this W should actually be W1, uh, W2 and XI should be X1, X2. Okay, this is the distance from a point to a line. Uh, so this W1, W2 square, if you take the W vector, it is nothing but the square of the magnitude of the W vector. I think there is a square root square. So I can write this as in vector notation. B, this is the modulus, that means the positive value because distance has to be positive. This is the magnitude of the W vector, is the magnitude of the W vector denoted by this symbol. So uh, as you know, if you have a vector W1 and F2, in magnitude is W1 square plus W2 square root over. Okay, so the distance, let me call it as di, is the, this is the distance of the xi to the line. So what is margin? Margin is the minimum value of this distance over all i. Okay, because for, oh, as I have defined margin, so this is for this xi, this is the distance, this xi, this is the distance, this xi, this is the distance. You take the smallest among them. You take the smallest among them. Okay, so that will give your margin. Right, so uh, so margin is nothing but, uh, uh, is nothing but minimum of this quantity over all the xi's. Right. All right. So, uh, so um, now let us uh, check out another thing. So, uh, let me, okay, let me use this space. So, you tell me, so this line, so 1 plus 3x2 plus say 4 equals to 0, this is the equation of a line. 4x1 plus 6x2 plus 8 equals to 0. That is the equation of another line. You have so this is w1, this is w2, this is b. Hmm. This is b. Okay, so these have the, these two lines have the, but are they actually different lines or are they the same line? They are the same line. You can easily plot and see they are actually the same line. So what it means is that you can always scale or multiply W1 and W2 and B by the same quantity, it doesn't change your line. It doesn't change your line. But 
uh, but see, uh, so basically you multiply W and B by the same quantity and uh, so numerator denominator cancels out, the margin remains the same. Okay, so whatever value of this W and B you write down, if they are scaled with respect to each other by a same constant, then the margin remains the same. It, basically it is the same line, so geometrically the margin should be the same. So when I'm writing it down and co computing the minima, which equation should I take? Should I take 2x plus 3 or 4x plus 6? Which equation should I take? Okay, so I do some kind of normalization. I do some kind of normalization. And in the process of normalization, what I do, I multiply W and B by a constant such that the value of the uh, value of this numerator value of this numerator for the closest point for the closest point not for others for the closest point i multiply w and b in such a way such this numerator becomes equal to one numerator becomes equal to one hmm. note that you think a little bit i can always do that i can always no, but not one thing this margin value does not change because you are multiplying w and b are also multiplying w so it cancels out okay so the margin absolute value of the margin doesn't change but the numerator can be scaled numerator can be scaled and then i scale them uh, for any line i can do that if you think a little bit carefully you will understand uh, and i scale it in such a way so that the closest point has a numerator value equal to one equal to one hmm. and since it is a closest point that is also the minimum value it will have so this entire quantity minimum over all xi w xi plus b it is the closest quantity uh, it is the minimum so it is the for the closest only it will be the minimum so this uh, this entire quantity becomes equal to one right in other what is the advantage of this because moment i do this normal but not one thing this w cannot be any value this w should be the scaled value only moment you do this you can define your margin as one by norm of w because the numerator is one one by norm of w in fact not exactly one by norm of w because this is on one side <coughs> This is on one side. Similarly, you have on the other side. So multiply it by two. So it is two by norm of W. Okay. So margin is two by norm of W. Okay. Now I think we will understand this because I said that if y equal to one, this should be positive. Positive means greater than zero. But also I have said the minimum value that this can have is one. Okay, so if the minimum value is one, then this would be greater than equal to uh, minimum absolute value is one and it is positive. So it should be greater than equal to plus one. Similarly here, the minimum absolute value is one and it has to be negative. So it has to be less than minus. Right, so, uh, so these are the constants instead of greater than zero because i have scaled w i have scaled w and b so it would, would be greater than equal to one this would be less than equal to minus one all right so uh, and i have defined margin to be two by norm of w hmm. so now let me again redefine the property of the line the uh, discriminator that i want the property should be First property should be this one. That means for all values of xi and yi, w and b should be in such a manner after scaling that this should hold. This is the first property. And among all the lines, so you can also think of this property as a constant on w and b. And among all the lines satisfying that constant, you pick up the one which has the largest value of this margin. You pick up the one which has the largest value of this margin. Right, so, so uh, you can see, so now it is a 
classical optimization problem. So finding the class boundary or the decision boundary is equivalent to solving a optimization problem. What is the optimization problem? Uh, optimization problem is you uh, see W and B are free variables. That's their value only I want to find because the moment I find out W and B, I know the slope of the line. W is W1, W2, and I know the intercept of the line, which is B. Okay, I can draw the line. Okay, so the, the problem is that of finding W and B. And I find W and B. So this W and B in the optimization literature, this is called a free variables. And this yi, xi, these are the training sets. They are already given. So these are the constants or parameters. So what is the optimal pro optimization problem? Optimization problem is this is a constant. That means all plus one points in one side and the minus one points in the other side. And this is an objective function, which is the mark. So margin I have defined to be two by norm of W. I wanted to maximize this, maximize this, which is equivalent to, I want to minimize half norm of W, I want to minimize this. And since W is positive, if I instead minimize half norm of W whole square, that would also minimize half of norm of W, right? So, uh, so, so, the, so, maximizing margin maximizing margin is same as minimizing this quantity is same as minimizing this quantity right so this is the objective function so basically uh, this constant along with the constant along with the objective function gives me my optimization problem and if i solve this optimization problem i will get a value I'll get a solution which is a value of W and B. Moment I know the value of W and B, I can draw the line. Okay, so now uh, let us try to solve this optimization problem. Okay, all right. So let us look at the optimization problem. So the optimization problem is that you have a constant which is a little bit complex and you have an objective function which is a little bit simple. What I try to do, I use a standard optimization technique called the method of Lagrangian multipliers. Those who have done linear programming uh, will know about it. We, we use a method of the Lagrangian multipliers. And what the Lagrangian multi this method will do is that it will give you, it will transform this optimization problem into an equivalent optimization problem. Equivalent in the sense that the solution of this optimization problem, that means the value of uh, w and B, let's call W star and B star that we get by solving this problem is one and the same as solving that equivalent problem. So this problem we call as the original problem, this problem we call as the primal optimization problem and the problem that we transform after using Lagrangian multipliers we call the dual optimization problem. The solution of the primal problem and the dual problem are one and the same. Okay, now let us look at dual problem. How do you get the dual problem? We do it by introducing a number of positive constants, or not constants, positive values known as the Lagrangian multipliers. Let's say I denote them by alpha one, I denote them by alpha one, alpha two. There will be as many Lagrangian multipliers as the number of training points. So for every xi, x1, x2, xn, there will be a corresponding Lagrangian multiplier, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. So not one, I introduce n Lagrangian multipliers. And I transform the problem in this way. Okay, uh, the problem is, this is my primal problem. That is minimize half of norm W square, which is equivalent to maximizing margin, subject to Wi, uh, yi wt xi plus b uh, so the oh, let's look at the problem the problem was w w i w uh, sorry yi wi 
wxi plus p should be greater than equal to 1 for all i. This is equivalent to 1 minus, this is equivalent to this. Okay, this is equivalent to this for all i. Again, i equal to 1 to n. Sorry, this n should be capital N. i equal to 1 to n. Is the primal, is the primal problem. We transform it into a dual problem. The dual problem is as follows. The dual problem is, uh, so the, the objective function I call as the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian has the original objective function. Note that the, this, uh, this is the absolute value of this W vector squared. So this can actually also be written as half of W trans. You can easily verify W transpose W. W is this W1, W2 vector in, in our case. In general, it can be a d-dimensional vector. Okay, so uh, I'm just writing it this way. So algebraically, uh, I want to remove this norm kind of thing. I want to sort of look like a multiplication, a square term. Okay, so this original objective function is there. Plus, you see this constant. This constant I have got here. Multiply it by a Lagrange multiplier and added up over all the endpoints. Added up over all the endpoints. And, and this alphas, I want to, uh, is a Lagrange multiplier, I want them to be positive or zero. Hmm. Okay, so what is the kind of thing? Kind of thing is, the, is noted that you have the original objective function, take the constraints, note that, okay, by the way, this is not a single constant actually, this is n number of constants. So this is one minus y1 wt x1 plus v less than equal to zero, one minus y2 wt x2 plus v less than equal to zero. So this is actually a set of n constants. Okay, so I, each of these constants, I multiply by the corresponding Lagrange multiplier. There are as many, so there is as many constant as the number of training points, n. There are as many Lagrange multipliers as the number of training points, n. I'll multiply these two and I add them up. And I add them up. Okay, and I add it to the original objective function and I minimize this entire thing. And this way, my constant goes away. Instant, instead, I have a much simpler constant that the Lagrange multiplier should be greater than zero. I have a much simpler constant. And this is my objective function. Note that again, this constant is also not a single constant. It is a, a number of constants. Okay. Uh, very intuitively, you can think of this in the following manner. It means that, see, I wanted this to be as much less than zero as possible. As much less than zero as possible. That means I want this to be as small as possible. So I'm minimizing it. I'm multiplying by a positive number, so it's still as negative as possible. And I'm minimizing the entire thing. Okay, but very sloppily, not, not mathematically. Okay, so uh, this is my modified objective function. And this is my modified simple constant. And this entire thing is my dual problem. As I have said before, using optimization theory, you can say the solution, that means the best value of w, w and b, which I call w star and b star, that I get by solving this problem is the same as that I get by solving the this problem. So I might as well solve this problem. Hmm. Why? Why I'm solving this, doing this transformation? Let's see, it will, it will be easier. Uh, algebraically. Okay, so now uh, once that is accepted, then let us forget about this primal problem. Look at only at the dual problem and try to solve it. Hmm. So what are the variables? Free variables. W is a free variable. B is a free variable. Alpha. This Lagrange multipliers are the free variables. Hmm. And this is the objective function is the constant. All right. So you know at minima, because I want to minimize the Lagrangian, at minima, the partial derivative of Lagrangian has to be zero. So 
I can I can say that at minima I have del Lagrangian. I don't know if I can write it properly. Del L del W should be equal to zero. Del L del B should be equal to zero. Okay. And similarly, del, del lambda equal to zero, del alpha equal to zero, and that is trivial. That is just a constant. So, uh, so uh, these two property, any Lagrangian which I am minimizing, any objective function for that matter, should be satisfied at the minima. Let us try to derive this. So, what is this? This is L. What is del L del W? Uh, what is del L del W? So, del L del W. So this is the Lagrangian. This is the Lagrangian as I have said before. I am um, because see each of these are vectors x i x w. These are all vectors. So if the vectors has the components k, if I expand, forget about this. Let us initially consider they are to be scalars only. But actually they are vectors. Uh, as I said that uh, del l del w should be equal to zero. What is del l del w? Can you can anybody tell in this? What is the partial derivative of this expression with respect to W? So half of W square, uh, W transpose W, uh, again intuitively you can think of as W square. So what is derivative of half of W square with respect to W? It is W itself. And derivative of half W square is W. Next term, next term is alpha i. Okay, summation alpha i. Summation alpha i is independent of w, so partial derivative is zero. Next term, summation alpha i y i w t x i. Summation alpha i w t. I am expanding. I am just expanding these terms. What is the partial derivative of that with respect? To what is the partial derivative of Summation alpha i y i w x i with respect to w. It is nothing but minus is there. So minus is there. So this minus should be there. It is nothing but this quantity. Nothing but this quantity. Okay, because w cancels out partial derivative. Third term. Third term is summation alpha i b independent of w, so that is zero. So if we say del l del w to be zero, you get this to be equal to zero. If we just rearrange the terms, you get at the minima, because at the minima this holds, at the minima w equal to summation alpha i y i x i. At the minima, this summation alpha i y i x i. Okay. Uh, that means it is a very interesting thing. It means that if you somehow find the value of alpha i at minima, because x i y are given, and there are a number of examples x i y are given, then using just the value of alpha i, you can compute w, the slope of the line. How do you compute? You just add up alpha i y i x i over all n. Okay, so that means if I know alpha i, which is the min at the minima, then I can compute w just by plugging in these values. Because x i y i are given training points unknown. Now let us set del l del l lost again. Yes. Now, uh, now let us say del L del B equal to zero. So this is L. This is my L. So del L only term containing B is summation alpha I B. Other terms do not contain B. So their partial derivative will be zero. 
here summation alpha i b partial derivative uh, alpha i y i b actually so some, their partial derivative will be uh, their part, a partial derivative will be this and this is equal to zero so at minima these two very important things we have these two very important things we have by just by applying the condition of the minima del l del w equal to zero okay now what i will do is that so i have an i have i have expressed w in terms of alpha i'll substitute this value of w at the minima in this expression i'll substitute the value of w in this expression okay so if we substitute w in l in l uh, you can actually easily check it it's not very difficult algebra it is so this w gets replaced by summation alpha i w i i x i this w again gets replaced by this so you have a it's like it's like double summation so if okay anyway this i'm not working out so if we work out this and wherever the many times this summation alpha i y i comes or here summation y i alpha i comes here summation y i alpha i comes and we know that is equal to zero we know that is equal to zero so if i do all these things and so basically if i set them to if i set them to zero l simplifies to just an just an expression l simplifies to just an expression which involves only the alphas okay so l is minus half i equal to 1 to n summation again j equal to 1 to n summation alpha i alpha j y i y j x i x j but x is a vector so it is x i transpose x j or x i dot x j plus summation alpha i plus summation alpha i okay so l this lagrange multiplier uh, so my final dual problem is my final dual problem is minimize this expression of alpha subject to alpha i greater than equal to 0 for all i for all i okay this is the dual problem so the new objective function is a function of alpha only it is a uh, function of the alpha only in fact, this transformation is called a Carus Kuntrakar transform theory. It's a, this Lagrangian transform. It's a optimization theory. Those who have studied optimization will know about it. Okay. It says that you maximize this quantity. Uh, okay. This quantity is actually the negative of this quantity. So that's why. Uh, no, this should be this. I think I made wrong. This should be minimized. Okay, you minimize this quantity subject to alpha i greater than equal to zero. Yeah. Any question? I cannot see the chat box, so if anybody reads it out, I'll be able to. Anyway, let me go ahead. So this problem, uh, this is a uh, dual problem, uh, which is a function of only alpha because x i uh, y i are given. If I solve this problem, you see I get a set of values of alpha. I, I can just plug in those values here and get my w. Get my w. And one more thing. See, this problem is objective function is quadratic in alpha and the constants are linear in alpha. So this type of problem is called a quadratic programming problem. Quadratic programming problem. Okay. Usually these problems are solved by numerical methods some gradient descent or some method they are solved numerical methods 
right? Uh, I am not going to again. There are many algorithms like uh, sequential minimal optimization, SMO, and other such things. Such that. Okay, and you solve them. You you get a value of alpha i. Plug in your value to alpha i. Uh, plug in your values of alpha i here, and you get your w. Get your W. In fact, let me write down a vector notation here, which is uh, more useful. Do I have the vector? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't have the notation. Let me write it down. Okay, so uh, if I call alpha to be this vector. <laughs> And H has something called a Hessian matrix, which is like this. So it is a n cross n matrix. The ith entity of the ith entity of the Hessian matrix is nothing but y i y j x i transpose x j. This is the ith entity of the Hessian matrix. So it is a since there are I, x i equal to one to n, x j equal to one to n. So take two two examples x one x two. To input uh, vectors x1, x2, take their dot product, multiply their class levels. What you get is a scalar, and that is the entry of the ith matrix. So if I take all n cross n, you get a full matrix. That is the Hessian matrix. So this I call as the Hessian matrix. Okay, and let me consider another n number of one, one vectors, n number of one vector. So this W. Can be written as sir. Huh? Mathematically, can we solve? No, you cannot have a closed form solution for this. Yep. So for software, can, for software, can you use MATLAB? Yes, I, I'll tell that. In the end, I'll tell that there are a lot of softwares for solving this. Huh? Okay. Just in the end, I'll tell about them. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So this can be written as this alpha is this. Uh, let me. Okay, alpha. So this is the alpha vector into u u transpose minus half alpha h alpha transpose. Okay, so this alpha is a variable, h is a constant which is getting from x i x j y i i j, and this is my optimization function. And this h captures everything about the data y i x i x j everything about the data training set is captured in h. Okay, so this is a standard form of a QP problem. Uh, it is solved. It will give you values of alpha. Once you get the value of alpha, you plug it in here. Now there is a very interesting property. There is a very interesting property. The property is that we said that we said that. We want alpha i to be greater than equal to zero. So they can be either zero or positive. After getting the solution, so there are many alpha. If there are n number of, if there are thousand turning points, there will be thousand alpha i's. Most of the time, people saw one thing. People saw that if there are thousand alpha i's, nine ninety of them are zero. So, uh, so alpha i equal to zero for many of the points. And only for say maybe 10 points, it is greater than zero. So most of the alpha is at zero. Only few of the alpha is are greater than non-zero, greater than zero. That means a very interesting thing because if alpha i is equal to zero, that x and y does not contribute to w. Only the non-zero alpha is contribute to w, and say only 10 10 out of 1000 are non-zero. So only 10 of the x size, 10 of the x size will determine your w. Only few out of thousand, only 10 will determine w. Okay. Now let us see which are the ones which will determine w. Okay. Uh, so there is. Uh, see, we have said that. Let me go to the primal problem. Yes, this is the primal problem. Let me erase this first. Right. 
right, yeah. Anyway, so you, you see that this alpha is greater than zero. If alpha is greater than zero, the corresponding alpha is called an interior solution. And if alpha is equal to zero, it is called a boundary solution. Similarly, it is less than or equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, it is called a boundary solution. And if it is less than zero, it is called an interior solution. Hmm. There is a theory called the Carlos Kuntaka theory, which says that the, there is a duality between these two. That means, uh, one more thing you note that for every alpha i, there is a corresponding xi. Hmm. Alpha is for the dual problem, and xi is they are in the primal problem, constant of the primal problem. So it says that the solutions which are interior in the dual are boundary in the primal, and solutions which are boundary in the primal in the dual are interior in the primal. That means if alpha i equal to zero, then for the corresponding xi, this will be less than zero. And if alpha i is greater than zero, and the, the corresponding uh, dual, this will be equal to zero. Hmm. So if alpha is greater than zero, xi will be such that this is equal to zero. If alpha is greater than zero, xi will be such that this will be equal to zero. Hmm. But now let us see. So, uh, so basically, if alpha is equal to zero, you are not interested. They do not determine W. We are interested in the point in which alpha is greater than zero. And as I have said before, if alpha is greater than zero because of Carus Kuntaka theorem, the corresponding xi for the corresponding xi, this will be equal to zero. This will be equal to zero. Okay. That means, in other words, uh, this yi wt xi plus b will be equal to 1. yi is plus 1 or minus 1. So the magnitude of this quantity will be equal to 1. So the magnitude of this quantity, magnitude of this quantity, absolute value, not magnitude, will be equal to 1. And if you remember, I said the when you tell me magnitude equal to 1, I have scaled w and b in such a way for the closest point, it will be equal to 1. For the closest point equal to equal to 1. So that means if we come back to this geometric picture, what will happen is that for all the points which are inside, their alpha will be equal to zero. And the points which are on the boundary of the margin, their alpha will be non-zero. Their alpha will be non-zero. For everybody else, alpha will be zero. And if alpha is zero, sorry, if alpha is zero, they are not determining your W. See, only these three points, this point, this point, and this point, points which are on the boundary, they determine W because W is this. We have derived before W is this. So these points which are on the margin boundary and for which alpha is non-zero are called the support vectors. called the support vectors. Are called the support vectors. And this line, is called the support vector machine. Sometimes it is also called the optimal separating hyperplane. Okay. Uh, why the name support vector? Name support vector means because as if uh, these points are supporting this line. They are not, if you to balance the torque and other thing, they'll hold this line in this position. Hmm. So that is the, uh, the, the, so these and these are the, uh, as I have said, these are the support vectors. There are three support vectors. Point to be noted is that among all the training points, only few of them are support vectors. The others are not support vectors, but they are important in the sense that W is determined by this equation using only the, so actually I can, instead of J equal to one to N, I can write J equal to one to S, where S are the support vector, because for others alpha is equal to zero. Okay, so the, this is the, uh, Support vector. So if we summarize the steps, 
to summarize the steps. And what we do? First, we create this Hessian matrix Y I Y J X I X J. Pass it on to this from this quadratic programming problem. Pass it on to the uh, QP solver, QP numerical QP solver. You get the values of alpha is. Once you get the value of alpha, I, plug them in. Take the non-zero alpha is, plug them in for the support vectors. Give the value of W. How do I get B? Because I know for, for pick up any support vector. I know for a support vector W dot X I plus B. This absolute value should be uh, magnitude should be one. Okay, and uh, X I is a support vector by the definition. W I already know from this equation. X I I know given B I can find out from this equation. So you have to pick up any one support vector. You already know the value of W from this equation. Put it there, you'll get the value of B. Because if it is a support vector, you know the value of XI. Right, so this is the overall thing. Now, uh, this may actually for large number of points, and this matrix Hessian N by N is very large. Suppose you have 1 million training point. It is 1 million by 1 million. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, optimization tricks like sequential minimal optimization, which solves this very fast. OK, uh, so I'm not going into those optimization problems. Now uh, let us look into another problem. Mm. So all this while I have assumed that the classes are separable. That means there, are, there is you can actually draw a line which separates two classes. But suppose there is some overlap in the class. There is some overlap in the class. So you cannot draw a line. So they are not linearly separable. So how do you solve such a case? So that such a case is solved by using this technique. So here I said, what is this margin? The margin is kind of a no man's land. No. What happens? kind of a no man's land. So there is no point inside. Hmm. Uh, algebraic is for all i, y i w x i plus b is greater than equal to one. But that is not possible if there is a wall among the classes. So there will be. So what I do, I allow kind of a slack or an error. I say that some points are allowed inside this margin also. And this is the error I denote by xi. This is the error or the slack. Error of the slack. Okay. So I allow some slack. What is the meaning of slack? Earlier I said that this w x i plus b should be greater than equal to 1 for all i but now that is not possible okay if not greater than 1 can i make it greater than 0 0.8 0 0.9 that means 1 minus 0 0.1 1 minus 0 0.2 so this minus 0 0.1 minus 0 0.2 these are the slack these are the tolerances allowed hmm. so basically you allow some people to be in this normal land you will not kill them but in your objective function, you add an additional term, which is the amount of slack. So you want to minimize the amount of slack. So you allow people here, but you penalize for coming inside the margin to penalize them. OK, how you penalize them? You penalize them because every slack you allow, that will be an penalty in the objective function, which you have to minimize. So not exactly, so what I do is that uh, not exactly summation xi, I multiply it by a constant c and then add it to the objective function. Okay. Uh, so you see this xi I sort of this slack uh, uh, controls the amount of error you allow on the training set. Whereas this half of W square margin allows the generalization error. So this constant c is called the generalization constant generalization constant 
constant. Okay, it controls how much importance you want to give to generalization error and how much importance you want to give in the training set error. Okay, okay. So this has to be user specified. This this does not come from the optimization problem. User gives this value of C. So once you have given a value of C, your new optimization problem for this overlapping class case, linearly non-separable case, becomes this is my new object. It is exactly same as before, except for the additional penalty of slack or error. And the constant is earlier was only this much. Now I allow a slack. So it is a slightly modified uh, objective optimization problem. Uh, if you, I'm not going through that algebra again. If you go through that algebra again, you get the same kind of derivation: del L del B equal to zero, del L del W equal to zero. I'm not going through them. Not going through them. Uh, it turns out that um, the dual problem, after all this algebraic manipulation, looks the same in the objective function. So objective function stays the same. The constant, uh, this also stays the same. This constant slightly changes. Earlier, the constant was alpha i should be greater than or equal to zero. It would be positive or zero. There is a lower bound on alpha i. Now you also have an upper bound on alpha i, which is c. Alpha i cannot exceed c. Hmm. So alpha i should be between zero to c, inclusive of both. Okay. So, so uh, this is again a quadratic programming problem. Again, uh, a linear constant quadratic objective function. Again, some using Cupid solver numerical method. And this again, you have, uh, have some support vectors that is alpha i non zero. And you have the same expression for W. You have the same expression for W. Hmm. So, so alpha i, y, i, x, i. But now, uh, now, uh, the earlier the support vectors were only points on the boundary. So this was called the hard margin SPM. Now there are some support vectors inside the margin also. So this margin is called a soft margin or a soft margin hyperplane. Hmm. Soft margin SPM. Uh, and uh, earlier only the points on the boundary were having alpha i Lagrange multiplier equal to greater than zero, others were having d equal to zero. Now, points on the boundary as well as points inside the margin are support vectors. Oh, they have alpha i greater than zero. Others have all, still have alpha. So all these still have alpha equal to zero. So this is the soft margin. Uh, you can also extend it to non-linearly separable, but I think I'll, 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 I'll... Okay, let me quickly tell this. Okay, so... Uh, so in all this while, I was drawing a straight line to separate the classes. But suppose the classes look like this. Hmm. Suppose the classes look like this. Uh, even though they are separable, you cannot draw a line to separate them. You have to draw the curved surfaces to separate them. So the question was, can this previous method that I have discussed so far, can it still be used? Mm, the thing is that it can still be used. How you do is that you don't solve the problem in the original space. You try to solve the problem in a transformed space by a transformation phi called the feature space, which is usually higher dimensional than the original input space. And maybe in this new space, this is Mm, linearly separate. Let me give an example. Suppose this this function, this curve line is fx, and this fx equal to zero rather. This fx equal to zero looks like this. Say two x square plus three x two uh, three. Oh no! So there are two variables x one x2. This will look like 2x1 square plus 3x2 square plus 4x1 x2 plus 5x1 plus 7x2 plus 10 equal to 0. Let's say this is the equation of fx. I do a coordinate transformation. I say 
my x1 prime i define a new coordinate system is x1 square original x1 square x2 prime x2 prime is original x2 square x3 prime is x1 x2 x4 prime is x1 x5 prime is x2 okay so i have a new coordinate system x1 prime x2 prime x3 prime x4 prime x5 prime in this new coordinate system you see this f of x prime if i write down it becomes 2 x1 prime 3 x2 prime 4 x3 prime 5 x4 prime 7 x5 prime plus 10 equals to 0 which is a equation of a line equation of a hyperplane rather Right. Okay. By earlier case, if you generalize it beyond line to higher dimension, it's called a hyperplane. Okay. So a nonlinear surface, if we map it to higher dimensional space by a suitable coordinate transform, which I call phi, it becomes a linear surface. Hmm. So this is known, and and once it becomes a linear surface, then I can use my previous method. I have this. So only thing I need to do is that initially when I'm given some training set, I'll directly not design a SBM on them. I'll do a suitable coordinate transform to first project it to a higher dimensional space, and using vectors in this higher dimensional space, I will solve my optimization problem and get my support vectors. Okay. And so, when a new point comes, first I have to transform it to that new space, then check what side of the hyperplane in the higher dimension it is, and then find out its class level. Okay, so this is how uh, I'll be doing. Hmm. So this is called the Carnell trick. In fact, it turns out that uh, to solve this, because you see in your objective function in this high dimensional vectors, all I was doing is I was taking Only operation among vectors I was taking is a dot product. Okay, so if we can find a function called a Carnell function which computes this dot product, then this Carnell function is enough. I I I don't need any other vector. So this uh, instead of x, this phi as I have said is a transformation. So phi x i is x i prime. This transformation. Uh, instead of x i prime, I am writing phi x i, which is the mapping projection. So if I have a Carnell function k x i x j, which computes this dot product, what I will do is that instead of x i prime x j prime, I'll replace this by k of Carnell function x i x j. Okay. So my objective function, objective function will have a small modification. Instead of x i dot x j, it will be k of x i x j, where k x i is the Carnell function or this nonlinear transformation I was talking about, this coordinate transformation. Okay, so now people have tried out different kind of Carnell function. They have tried out. Uh, there are some mathematical. Uh, this is a worked out example. You can go through the slides later. I I think I don't have time to do it. This is an example where this kind of nonlinear function has been mapped to a linear function. Okay. So there are uh, so these are the there are some mathematical conditions that they should satisfy. But as I have said, the only change you need is this replacing this simple dot product, which by the way is called a linear kernel, by this other general nonlinear kernel. There can be many kinds of nonlinear kernel. Again, I am not going to this example. There are many kind of nonlinear kernel. There can be a Polynomial kernel, so kernel between u and v is u dot v to the power d. There can be a polynomial kernel up to degree d k k of x y is k x dot y plus one to the power d. There can be a RBF kernel. This is an RBF kernel. If you replace d by two, you get a quadratic kernel. RBF kernel, you can get a sigmoid kernel. Hmm. So these are different kind of kernel functions you can get. You can think of a kernel function. As a so the linear kernel x dot y is nothing. What is x dot y is the product of their magnitude and cosine of the angle between the dot product of two vector. It is the alignment of two vector. If they are fully aligned, the kernel function is highest. Here in the RBF kernel, if these two vectors are close, then their kernel is less. So depending on what type of 
nonlinear uh, unfortunately there is given a data set nobody knows which kernel will give you the best result okay so people try out different kind of kernel and see so this is the kind of boundary you get in rbf kernel okay you can actually there is a rule that if you have two kernels k1 and k2 you can combine them by linear combination you can take their exponential you can take their product all these become valid kernel okay this is an example of a uh, nonlinear kernel, a quadratic kernel, polynomial kernel. Hmm. So you have to choose your kernel function. So in summary, there are many things I'm not going. Uh, you have to prepare the matrix. You have to select the kernel function. You have to choose a parameter value C, generalization constant. You have to create the Hessian matrix. That is the standard form of QP. Pass it on to a QP solver. I'll tell you what uh, QP solver are. You get a value of Lagrangian matrix as alpha. I plug it into W to get the value of W. When you get a new point, you just check the sign of W x plus b. If it is positive, you put in one plus negative other class. Right. In fact, you need not compute the W because W is summation alpha i y i x i. You can directly plug it into that equation to get the sign W to x i plus b equal to zero if you substitute the value of W. Okay, so you need to choose two things. You need to choose the kernel function and you need to choose the value of the generalization constant C. And then there are many softwares. Hmm. Uh, LibSPM, which has all these QP solvers, everything constructing the Hessian matrix, finding the support vectors, doing the classification building. Hmm. LibSPM is a popular, MATLAB has a support vector toolbox, PyTorch, all these have support vector toolbox. Uh, there are there is one software called SPM Lite, which is a very fast optimization, very large matrices you give, it will very quickly do it. Hmm. So, but LibSPM is most popular. Uh, all these Scikit-learn and other Python toolboxes, they have LibSPM built in. They have LibSPM built in. Okay, these are libraries which are called by them. Uh, there are many MATLAB toolboxes, Python toolboxes of SPM. You can use them. Mm, so, in summary, I have uh, so the, uh, I have just given an overview. There are some more mathematical details that are you can if you go to the slide you'll find it. But this is a very popular method. It is very easy to train. Scales well to high dimensional data. And the uh, trade off between generalization and training error can be controlled. Many kernels can be considered. The drawback is you have to choose the value of C. You have to choose the value of kernel function. These are still open problems. So there are many researchers who design their own kernel function for their own particular purpose. Okay, so this is my conclusion. It is a very useful alternative to other deep learning and other techniques that are currently in practice. Maximize the margin and apply the kernel trick. Many implementations are available. You can try them out to get a more idea. Okay. So now I'll, uh, so I am, these are the resources, kernelmachines.org, supportvector.net. This is a very nice tutorial, ICML tutorial, uh, which you can go through. Uh, okay, to, for the details of the derivations. Uh, so thank you. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask. You can ask. Uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions now. If you have any questions, you can now ask. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, for uh, multi-class uh, classification. Yes, I, I missed that. I, I am quickly doing that. Yes. I, I just Hello. That. Hello. Hi, sir. Hello? Can, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. OK. Sir, uh, for multi-class or multi-disease classification, which yes, technique I, is the so which uh, no, uh, I have, I have missed that part, I'll tell you. So in general, SVM is designed for two class. So if you have multi-class, if suppose I have a K class problem, you break it up into K two class problem. For example, class one versus class one is positive class, everything else is negative class. Class two is positive class, every, so to solve a K class problem, you solve K number of two class problems. Hmm. So now there are two ways of doing it. One is one against all. That means class one is plus, rest are minus. Class two is plus, rest are minus. Second is one against one. That means one is plus, two is minus, pairwise. 
टेक्निक इज द बेस्ट uh actually uh, i have seen that uh, different uh, uh, researchers have uh, already used and the uh, accuracy more or less 98 99 um, 97 etc hmm. so i i i i i, I don't know man uh, our technique no. will be the so, or my answer is that uh, there are three things to consider first is what is the dimension of the input okay so multi dimension But how many? Hundred, thousand, twenty, ten thousand. So that dimension. If it is an image, it is very high dimension. So that yes. dimension. Second yes. is how many training examples you have. Hmm. Okay. Usually the rule is if you have D dimension, you have to have at least ten D number of training examples. Okay. And third is how many classes you have. Fourth okay. is what? How complex is the class boundary? How complex is the problem? So uh, the general rule is that if the input dimension is very high, and you have less number of training examples, then okay. support vector machine is best. Support vector machine. Yes. If sir. input dimension is less, you have large number of training examples, but class boundaries are very complex, then neural network is better. Okay. Okay. That's if you have less, wrap set is better. when number of in input dimension is moderate and you have very less number of training examples less number of training example ha ha okay then rap set is better but rap set cannot realize very complex class boundary it has to have a simple class boundary hmm. so these factors have to be seen like but again this is a gen- i am telling a very general term because a general term because a high low this doesn't have any meaning so exactly in what problem general thumb rule is if you have d number of input dimension 10d should be there for linear class boundary for non linear class boundary actually, sir, sir actually i am working on the ecg signal and using ecg signal uh, i want to classify basically heart disease Uh, so we yes. have uh, taken initially we have uh, two heart disease and uh, currently we are working on five heart disease. Uh, so now one uh, we want to uh, classify uh, this uh, five uh, heart disease. So already yeah. we have implemented the using half set, but I don't know. I mean, actually, I want to just uh, know that the uh, our method will be. Uh, can I implement it using this half uh, set? For this five uh, class classification or not? Yes, yes, easily, <laughs> easily. Okay, okay, easily. You can answer. Uh, answer another question is suppose uh, after classification, if uh, if uh, I will uh, get uh, uh, the accuracy ninety eight percent. Suppose and uh, other uh, other uh, different type of technique on other researcher they will already uh, they are already implemented and their uh, accuracy ninety eight ninety nine. So um, that's, uh, that time. Uh, already like uh, this data this data or this database uh, same database uh, they are used and i, I, I am uh, using uh, so our accuracy and their accuracy both are same so our paper will be published or not that time so you have to you have both the, both the, both the accuracy no. both the same you have to show some advantage for example one advantage of rap set is that it is very fast Time complexity is very less. Yes, 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 yes. I am telling. So that time, sir, uh, I want to uh, actually. Uh, I will prove the uh, using rough set. The time complexity will be minimized. 
time complexity and also space complexity if you can show that without sacrificing accuracy you are reducing the time that is a great contribution okay okay thank you sir thank hmm. you sir so that's why it will uh, get accepted but uh, you have to really part, highlight uh, that that part actually i am trying no but you have to highlight that in the paper that that is the main uh, objective of the paper objective of the paper time complexity and space complexity ah, okay so that you have okay. to highlight okay then okay. it will thank be uh, and that you have to properly show both theoretically experimentally you have to show that hmm. ah, okay thank you sir. so actually accuracy is not the only parameter there are many things like if you can show something using very less number of training examples it is learning or it is robust uh -huh. to noise or it is uh -huh. all these are different dimensions hmm. so if you show them they are also good contribution okay hmm. okay sir thank you thank you sir hmm. any other question huh. yeah actually you can mail me later also so my email is given in the slides the uh, slides i think uh, the organizers you can ask they will share the slides with you i have already mailed it so if you if you you can check my email and if you have any further question you can also ask me hello sir yeah please
the link you, then you, uh, you, you, you search uh, youtube okay uh, okay I, sir i have, don't have the uh, uh, link right so uh, they will start. search with support vector machine the lecture uh, yeah, that also uh, yeah you can vector. search that uh, in fact there are much better also there are uh, from stanford university and other there are very good uh, video lectures in in support vector machine Okay, thank you once again, sir. Thank you uh, for your precious you. time uh, you gave and the lecture which you gave. Okay, the, you. There is an announcement for the uh, participants that we will uh, have a lunch break and we will come back at two. So the next uh, session will start from two p.m. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think sir have left. So, 